Hey everybody, it's Gauntletx, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena, and today we're going to be playing another premiere draft of The Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Without further ado, let's get into the draft. We've got a pick one, pack one, Hulking Raptor here, which is a sweet, sweet dinosaur. It's a four mana, five, three with ward two, so it's hard to target. And at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, you get double green. So if you can play this on curve, you can start spitting out so many dinos so quickly. It's pretty disgusting. The one issue with the card is it is quite low toughness for the mana cost. So if your opponent has something like a 2 mana 3 one, your 4 mana card can trade down into their 2 mana card. But it kind of makes up for that quite a bit by giving you like a, a reimbursement on the mana spent by giving you extra mana on future turns towards dumping bigger stuff out quicker, so I think Hulking Raptor is still really powerful and really worth it here to take it. Uh, if it weren't in the pack, I think it'd be a pretty easy Scampering Surveyor, because this is a great colorless card. It fits into any deck as a great value play. If you ever played Solemn Simulacrum in Commander, it's half of that card. It's a 4-mana 3-2 that searches your deck for any basic land, puts it into play tapped, which is pretty great. Very, very solid for any deck as a two-for-one little value play. Even if you don't care that much about the ramp, treat it like a four-mana 3-2 that draws a card when it hits the board, and that is pretty valuable. For pick two, we don't see an incredible green or red dinosaur option here to follow up the Hulking Raptor. We do see a pretty great rare, the Restless Ridgeline, we could take if we want to just immediately force green-red dinos. This would be a great dual land for us because it'll fix our mana early game and give us another threat if we run out of cards. So I like the Ridgeline a lot. I might just take it here, but I'm really tempted to take the Sunborn. I think this card is pretty incredible. Being able to discover three every time it attacks, as long as you have a couple random artifacts or creatures to tap down for it, which is not that hard to do in this format. There are some tokens you can have sitting on the board, like map tokens. There are treasure tokens as well, gnome tokens, little one ones and stuff. And the artifacts in this format, cards like the Stone Tree, are kind of like sorceries that then sit on the board as an artifact throughout the game, so you can have some of these random artifacts sitting on board for something like the Sunborn as well. So I am tempted to take that, but I am in the end still just going to go with a really great green-red dino land, the Restless Ridgeline there. For pick three, we do not see any good green or red dino cards. We see a great red aggro card. The Tomb Raider has been very, very impressive. There are plenty of solid artifacts in the format, as well as artifact tokens flying around. So this is consistently a 1-mana 2-2 haste, which is super under-costed. Very big for the mana cost, so this card's great. There's also the Everflowing Well, which is solid card draw for slower decks that can utilize their graveyard well. A lot of ways to do that. There's the Descend mechanic, as you can see on the Everflowing Well, where you want to have a set number of permanents in Grave, like 8 for this, or four for the frilled cave worm and there's the craft mechanic with the craft mechanic you can exile a card from your graveyard to flip your craft card so i think the everflowing well has a lot of good synergies and stuff too i think these two are my favorite by a lot the well or the tomb raider and since we are potentially already heading towards red with the ridge line i'll go for the tomb raider over the well there for pick four now Nothing great for green-red dinos, although Twists and Turns is a decent value play. It explores a little bit in the early game and then draws you a bunch of cards late game with the Mycoid Maze. It is spending some mana to not impact the board directly, which can be uh, a little rough in the early game, but I think it's a pretty good card. Um, outside of that, there's not too much going on in green or red. There's an okay Altasaur dinosaur, but certainly not something exciting, not a super high pick. My favorite card in the pack is probably just this Oltec Cloud Guard. We've seen a lot of cards already that can utilize tokens pretty well. Cards that tap multiple untapped creatures, or cards that have craft to exile an artifact like a gnome. And the Cloud Guard just has a lot of great synergies like that, spitting out the two bodies off the one card. So it plays super, super well, and I think it's going to convince me to take an off-color card here. Take the Cloud Guard out of white. For pick 5, we again don't really see any good dinosaur cards. We do see an incredible blue card, the Waterwind Scout. Again, any of these kind of cards that spit out multiple permanents from one spell have been playing pretty great. This one is a 2-2 flyer and a map token. You can use the map token to explore, which is a great way to set up your future draws, digging through some lands, or letting you get a counter onto your creature and surveilling. So if you don't want the card right now, you can shove it in your graveyard, which also works with all the graveyard mechanics in the format. Maybe you get to mill an artifact for your craft with artifact cards, 
or you get to just mill a permanent period for all your Descend cards, like Child of the Volcano, so that that has Descended and it gets its plus one, plus one counter. So Waterwind Scout has been uh, fantastic. I think it's easily the best card in this pack, regardless of color. So we're just going to start taking that um, and staying kind of open here, just taking the strongest cards in each pack. Now, for pick six, this pack is significantly weaker than the last few. I don't think there's anything in this pack that I would treat as a premium card for any deck in the format. Monstrosaur, I guess, is okay. The Mountain Cycling's a little overcosted, as is the body up front, the 6 mana, 6 5 trample. You're just not going to make it to 6 mana every single game, and when you do, it can get cleared out by a more efficient removal spell that costs much less than 6, and then you feel pretty bad when that happens too, and spending 2 to Mountain Cycle is also kind of a bit of mana. But again, there's really nothing exciting in this pack, so I think I still take the big dorky dinosaur for the top end of the curve. But I far prefer the ones that have like a good enter the battlefield effect, my favorite of which is the um, the 6 mana 7-7 seven, seven that scries 2 when it hits the board. I think that's my favorite common to have at the top of the curve. For pick 7, we've got a difficult choice, because Crewmate is a really good card for blue-red pirates, and a very solid reason to head in that direction. But we also have Sahili's Lattice, which is great for red-green dinosaurs. You get to discard a dinosaur to draw to as an early-game draw spell, and then it's also your 5-mana dino on curve, exiling that dino from your grave to flip into a big creature. So I think these are both incredible cards for their respective decks. We do have a couple premium cards for blue-red pirates, with the Scout and the Tomb Raider, but I think Hulking Raptor... And uh, mainly just the Hulking Raptor, but Hulking Raptor and Ridgeline are strong enough cards to try to convince us to keep on that Dino's deck when we can, when we do see playables for it. So take that here. Now, nothing good for anything except for blue decks. I like the River Herald Scout and the Waterlogged Hulk quite a bit. I think I prefer the River Herald Scout since it fits well into any deck as a decent value play with the Explorer ability. But the Waterlogged Hulk is really nice for the really grindy blue decks that mill a bunch throughout the game, because this becomes an unblockable 4-4 later to uh, completely finish your opponent off. So, pretty good card for specific blue decks, but River Herald Scout just fits in anything blue, so we'll take that one. Pick 9 doesn't really have anything here. There's a fine combat trick for green-red dinos, so we probably take that. Akawali is a solid card for the green-black mid-range self-mill kind of decks that are trying to fill the grave for Descend, but we look pretty unlikely to be in that direction. When we've been taking the strongest card in the pack, they've been mostly blue spells, some blue and some white, not much in black for the Aquali. and even though we took a Hulking Raptor, we just haven't seen many good green cards, so I don't think green's particularly open either. So if we're playing green at all, it's gonna be to play the Hulking Raptor green-red dinos list, hopefully. I don't think we get pushed into green-black in this draft pod with how things have shaped up so far. Now we have a stone tree, which is rampant to big dinos, but I actually really like a lot of the mid-range dinos the best, the four mana, five mana dinos, where you don't really need stone tree style ramp. Um, so not super pumped about that. I'll just take another staggering size. Pick 11 now. Not much going on here. Cave Worm's fine when you can fill your grave a lot for Descend, and Puzzle Door is fine when you have some craft cards that want to exile an artifact from your grave because you just shove it in your grave early, so... Let's take the puzzle door. Now we'll take a dirtily dinosaur, take the altasaur here. And I don't know what we're doing out of this draft pot. It looks like basically anything but black at this point is most likely. I guess we'll take the colorless filler equipment. We can put that in our deck no matter what. Not going to be a premium card, but it can fit in there. Same with the compass gnome. Okay, pack two, pick one. I did just say I'm probably playing anything but black. But the best card in this pack by a lot is Corpses of the Lost. So Skeletons you control will get plus one plus zero and have haste. That doesn't matter too much, but it's very, very fun flavorfully. And it does buff your own Skeleton Pirate that it makes. So it's three mana for a 3-2 haste. And then at the beginning of your end step, if you descended, you can pay a life to put this back in your hand. Which means you can just keep playing more and more three mana 3-2s three with haste off of this card as the game progresses as long as you keep descending. So this card is pretty nasty. And I think it's worth taking over the second best card, which is probably Poison Dart Frog, just for mana ramp. Yeah, I think Corpses of the Lost is good enough to speculate towards black, if we can get some really good black cards. 
Now, I have been pretty unimpressed by the Terror Tide, actually, because it's not really going to be a board wipe until very late in the game when you've filled your graveyard with a ton of permanents. So it's not super helpful in the most helpful position for board wipes, which is early in the game against aggro decks. So I don't love it for that reason. We do have a decent blue common with the River Herald Scout here, and we have two solid blue cards with the Scout and the Waterwind Scout. The River Herald and the Waterwind Scout, I should say. Um, we could take the Cloud Guard for a second white card, but I think that the Dig Site Conservator is probably the safest pick because it can make it into our deck no matter what, as some graveyard hate and just a fine filler card for literally any deck. Probably take the Conservator here. Cloud Guard is a lot better. Maybe that is impressive enough to get us pushing in the white direction here. Um, but we are getting very close to the point where you have to commit to something. I am going to go for the Cloud Guard over the Conservator in the end. But we see an Earthshaker Dreadmaw now. That could definitely get me to commit to Dinosaurs. A 6-6 Trample that draws you potentially multiple cards when it hits the board. I think it is the best card in the pack. Visage of Dread's also pretty good for black decks. Make your opponent discard a card and then flip this into a creature later to be a big two for one. Glimpse the core's decent ramp for Dino's decks. I'm going to take the Dreadmaw here. Kind of looking like Green Red can maybe get there in the end, but it's going to be rough. It's going to be some fierce competition for sure, because we're going to need to draft almost all playables from this point on with how many... Uh, packs we've been bouncing around a little bit for. Now we can take Sunfire Torch, which is solid removal if you have a lot of cheap attacking creatures. One damage to any target, you just have to attack with whatever has the torch on it. Okay, we get a Bristleback, which is a great card for the top of the curve. It also synergizes really well with our Sahili's Lattice, because it'll end up in the graveyard if we ever need to force cycle it. So I like the Bristleback here. I think we are pushing to green-red dinos in the end. So we've got 11 playables in one land. Gonna take some work. Gonna take some work for sure, but I think we can get there. Let's see. There's an armored kin color, which is perfect. 3 mana, 3-3 three, three dino that gains you 3 life on curve. Love this card a lot. Definitely better than the favor. We need a lot more creatures than we have right now, so let's start upping the creature count. Now we've got another Armored Kin Collar. Just spoke my piece on that, and I'm perfectly happy with it. Some great black cards this pack, which is awkward. Maybe blue-black would have been a solid place to be, because we still see decent blue like we saw in pack one, uh, but now we're seeing the black to go with it for the blue-black descend deck alongside the uh, Corpses of the Lost here. So blue-black, probably the dream position to be in for this draft pod. Uh, but now we can take a stone tree for ramping up, because now we do have two six drops and a seven drop, so we've got some big things to hit here. Let's take the stone tree. We get the poison dart frog to come back, and that was my second favorite card out of this pack, so I'm really happy to see that. That is incredibly helpful for us. I don't think we want a third staggering size, but it's competing with another just common combat trick, basically, so I guess at the end of the day... We might just be taking it here. I'm really not going to play three. Maybe I'll play two of that and one scythe. But I think no matter what I take there, it's just going to get cut. Now we take the Copybara. And now... We've got a deck pretty much no matter what happens. But we're definitely hoping to pick up some higher quality dinosaurs in the final pack here. So we'll see. But we have enough mediocre playables to have a mediocre deck at the end of the draft pod, even if we get zero cards out of uh, pack three. And here we are for pack number three. We're going to take the best dino card in each pack. And that's actually kind of contentious, kind of hard to pick here. I think for mana curve purposes, we want to take probably one and two drops over anything else because there are a good amount of four plus mana dinos. So I think we're supposed to take the yearling here just because of its mana value. But Brontodon is also really, really good. Main deckable artifact enchantment removal and a four toughness, three mana card. Three, four for three mana is a really good stat line. 
obviously a 3-2 Trampler for two is also a really good stat line. These are both incredible. It's actually a hard choice, but I'm going to go for the cheaper card here. Get the Yearling into the deck. Now for pack three, pick two, we want some more cheap curve stuff, like a Burning Sun Cavalry here. Could grab a Watley's Final Strike to get some more removal in the deck, because we don't really have any, but I think we're going to have to just leverage combat tricks as removal spells, because we need a lot more creatures than we currently have. We have 12 right now, so we need to get a two drop on curve for the Dino deck, or another 3-3 Kin Colors, solid. I'm going to take the on curve, two mana, 3-3 as long as we have another dino on board. This combat trick is also really nice, the Dreadmaw's Ire. I don't think it's gonna come back around, but again, we have a lot of non-creature options, not enough creature options, so we need to take creatures over this, even though this is probably a better card on average than the Burning Sun Cavalry. All right, ooh, great, great addition to this deck. This is gonna up our creature count, up our four drop slot, and up our removal, because it uses any dinosaur we have to deal damage to an opposing creature equal to its power. So this is the perfect card to slot in at the four mana slot on our curve, and we're really happy to see that. Excellent pickup here. Now we have another Burning Sun Cavalry to curve out with, or we've got another big six drop. With the Hulking Raptor, we can go a little big on 6-7 mana cards, but I think we're still doing pretty okay there. I'm going to get another 2 mana 3-3 three, three potentially with another Burning Sun Cavalry. Now, there's no Dinos here. There's another Combat Trick. There's the Dirtly Pirate, Dirtly Cat Warrior. I don't think I'm playing any of those. I actually like the Scampering Surveyor a lot here, that 4 mana 3-2 I was talking about. It's pretty great for any deck with the land fixing with the mana ramp of its enter the battlefield effect take a scampering surveyor here that'll jump us up from four mana turn four to six on turn five if we hit a land the turn after so that could be pretty good uh, i do like a tolly's favor in relatively aggressive decks but we might be low enough on removal to play the dorky six mana boulder probably not six mana is a whole whole lot um I don't think I have anything splashable. We could splash in Corpses of the Lost because it's funny. Because um, the Surveyor can get a Black Source, the Gnome can get a Black Source, and then we could take a Promising Vein to also get a Black Source. Probably a stupid idea, but because it's funny, I guess we'll go for the Black Splash here. Should not be a particularly difficult splash to get in. All right, Mana Ramp. No creatures, really. I'll just take the Cave, the Hidden Nursery here. Fits well with our Gnome and our Surveyor. Pick eight now. I guess I could play a spike tail for another way to splash black in here, but I think Glimpse the Core is just cheap enough uh, mana ramp to take that, grab a forest, put it into play for only two mana. Pretty awesome. Can't really try to splash in double black join the dead, so that'll be difficult. I'll take a dead weight, but I don't think we splash that in either. We did get Dreadmaw's Ire to come back. I like that a lot better than... Um, our Malamet size at the very least. I think this is a great combat trick. Super, super cheap. Only works when you're on the aggressive, so it's narrow, but it's insane when you are on the aggressive. Take that over the Necropolis Cave, because if we're using a Compass Gnome to grab a basic or a cave, we would rather just grab a Swamp than a Tapped Cave most of the time. The Surveyor is better with the Black Cave than it would be with a Swamp, but because we have the Surveyor and the Gnome, we probably just play a Swamp here. All right, In the Presence of Ages can be a draw spell, but not a super great one. Take a Hidden Nursery. I already have too many combat tricks. We'll throw a Spider in the sideboard. Throw a Join the Dead in there. And we just won't end up playing those. So, kind of a pretty medium deck here when it comes to the quality of our average cards. Our average creatures for the most part. But we do get to cut four of our most mediocre non-creature spells at least. Because we've got 16 creatures here, so we want to keep all those. Um, so Sahili's Lattice is great for non-creatures, and it kind of ups the creature count. So I guess we could cut this uh, Capybara, because it doesn't really work super well with our deck. That's honestly the only creature I think is super bad with this deck. If we cut that, and we still have Lattice as like a 16th creature, looks pretty good. I don't think we're aggressive enough to be super excited about Daring Discovery, and then the scythes are the most expensive dirtily of our uh, combat tricks. I guess we keep the stone tree in here because we do actually have three caves. 
in this deck that could flip it into the 5-5 late game, so that could work there. We also have two cards to search up some caves, so that helps too. This is actually looking pretty reasonable in the end, which is kind of surprising. Yeah, cut these three, and then I can, if we really want to, cut one more card, like cut a blowgun for the corpses of the lost, and put a swamp into this deck with our gnome, our surveyor, and our promising vein. It's cute, it's fun, might not be super worth it in the end. Because you've got to play this early and then just keep jamming it out every turn. Yeah. I don't think it's the greatest spell to splash in. You really want it to be like a core aspect of your deck. Our deck isn't super consistent at triggering Descend as well. Yeah, I'm just going to stick to our, uh, our pretty medium red-green dino pile. We could, with the curve as high as it is, potentially, with some of these fives and sixes, cut the blowgun for an 18th land. But I think with Compass Gnome, Stone Tree, Surveyor, we probably still go 17 lands here. And, uh, yeah, call it a deck like this. All right, here's look at our final deck list for today. We're on a green-red Dinos deck. Looks a little mediocre. There are some very exploitable flaws with this deck, but it's got a great curve. It's got some solid mana ramp between Glimpse the Core, Poison Dart Frog, Stone Tree, and Hulking Raptor to get to some big six, seven mana dinos. So that's pretty exciting. I love the creature curve and stuff in general going on there. And the mana ramp stuff. So that's pretty nice. But the big, really exploitable weakness that we have is a lack of interaction. We have one potential removal spell in our deck, and it's very narrow. We have to attack with the creature to use it, and it only does two damage to a target. So we are going to have a difficult time dealing with some, like, resolved bombs or anything. We can really uh, get destroyed by those. I guess we have two removal spells. We have the Torch, and then we also have the Firstborn of Gishath to have one of our dinos shoot something for damage. So still pretty low on removal. That's the biggest flaw with the deck. But if we curve out pretty well, get a lot of good creatures on the board, we can start using combat tricks like Staggering Size and Dreadmaw's Ire to beat in for extra damage. And... uh and potentially just crush them before they resolve anything too scary there. So green, red dinos, we've got a game plan. We're going to beat down and we're going to hope to deal a bunch of damage with some big old dinos. So without further ado, let's head into the gameplay and see how it does. Here we are on the play for game one. This is really close to a mulligan. All we're doing is setting up our mana and then sitting here. But we know we have a six mana five five late game because we have the cave to craft towards this. It's kind of like three non-land cards. I'm going to keep it and hope to draw some kind of cheap creatures. We've seen our mana curve. There are plenty of things we can hit here to get some stuff to do early game. Don't hit that, but we do hit a great six drop to ramp into off the stone tree. Our opponent is going to start with the Oaken Siren, and we unfortunately draw another land, which is quite bad here, but we do have a good chunk of land still in the deck, so that is going to happen. We're at four mana now. We'll have five mana up next turn for almost anything in the deck that we draw. There's a Sage of Days for our opponent to mill themselves a bit. Fills up stuff for Descend. Oh, wow. So they're going to keep a card, but they're going to mill a Tinker's Tote and an Abuelo, and these two together are insane. Abuelo keeps exiling and uh, and re-triggering the Enter the Battlefield effect of the Tote. So the fact that they choose to mill these two means whatever other card is there is probably incredible. And unfortunately, we didn't hit something to cast here. The curve is getting more and more awkward. We hit our only 7-drop and one of our 3-6-drops rather than any of our several 1, 2, 3 mana creatures we could find. Even 4 mana, 5 mana. So many things we could hit here to actually cast something that turn. And there's a Gigantic Bomb Mythic Rare that we cannot permanently kill. Even if we had removal, it can keep coming back from the Temple of Cyclical Time. And that is probably the complete death sentence here. I can play the Dreadmaw and draw no cards which does not feel exciting at all. 
We're probably casting a compass gnome and then playing Bristleback next turn and trying to go Bristleback into Dreadmaw. But I don't like it too much. Especially because all of our opponent's instants get cast twice now. They have rebound. So they cast them once and then they recast them next turn. I could try to um, Staggering Size the Gnome and block here. But against five open mana from the blue-white deck, it's going to play horrifically against any removal or combat tricks. So not going to go for it here. Which does mean I'm dead in two swings. But I think we try to do that later on a bigger creature that'll be harder for them to interact with. If anything, here's a torch. And theoretically clear out the siren. If I don't play any creatures here. There's the bristle back. Enough blockers on ground, even if I attack with the gnome, so we'll send that in. They have a combat trick to rebound here. Show us that the staggering size would have blown up in our face if we went for it. Well, this doesn't give reach anyway. I'm confusing it for a trick from another set, so we couldn't even try to reach block there. It's trample, not reach. So it doesn't matter. And there's waylaying pirates to stun the 3-3. Three, three. Yeah, it doesn't look like much we can be doing this game. I mean, we could have taken a mulligan and then been down a card against against these very solid flyers, but looks like a really rough matchup, even with a good hand, and we had a pretty poor one, so. Oh, and one to start it off. Almost guaranteed here. We're still going to play it out, but let's see. Is this combat trick for lethal? It is not. We're still at three. And no flying. So that's game. I can torch the siren and die to the big mythic flying thingamabob. So 0 and 1 heading into round two. Here we are for round two. Now we have Kincaller into the Raptor, and that gives us huge mana ramp from there. Pretty into this hand. This looks much, much, much better than round one. There's a clay fired bricks for our opponent to start off with. Draw planes, gain some life. Once they get to seven mana. They can buff their whole board and get a couple 1-1s one that are, uh, like, technically 2-2s, two which is pretty sweet. This Dread Mob might actually be awesome in this hand, because we've got two other dinos. If they can't clear them out, who three other dinos? And with the Raptor, we can play the Dread Maw turn 5, if the Raptor sticks around. And it's got Ward 2, so it very well may... Stay on the board. They're going to petrify the kin collar, but it's still on the board for the Dread Maw to draw two cards, which is pretty big. There's a War Scribe just as a 4 3 here. Could get a little greedy and wait on the Dread Maw till I have three other dinos on the board if I want. Just go for the Firstborn and the Poison Dart Frog. I don't hate it. It's definitely a little greedy, but I don't hate it. I'm going to go for it. Get some extra damage in this way with haste, which is cool too. I'll shoot them with the petrified uh, kin collar because it's funny. They are down to 15. And they're just going to concede. We don't even get to draw our three extra cards off the Dreadmaw. Well, that was the polar opposite of last game. That time we just had an insane curve and our opponent uh, did not get to play much. So one and one. Not uh, not particularly exciting or interesting games of Magic to start it off, though, as we head into round three. And here we are for game number three. Get this cavalry on the board. Definitely a surveyor turn for a really good combat trick. Yeah, I like the hand. Like the hand a good amount. 
find a sunfire torch if we need to clear out a small creature. If I don't top deck a land, we can put an untapped land on top of our deck with Compass Gnome to guarantee the turn 4 Surveyor, which should be pretty sweet, and the Surveyor can pull out a land into play tapped. Yeah, we didn't hit a land, so let's just, uh, let's Compass Gnome it up. Alright, jam for two. Here's the Compass Gnome. And we play the Torch, because the Dreadmaw's Ire only works on attacking creatures anyway. So no reason to hold it up for our opponent's turn. Red-green mirror match. They drop a river herald guide. So they're just more red-green good stuff than red-green dinos. A scallywag and a guide on board. So we can blow up their treasure token with Dreadmaw's Ire, which is pretty cute. If we end up wanting to use that on the attack here. I think I just want a Surveyor, though, and I'm cool with any onboard trades. Alright. Hit for four, drop the Surveyor. Promising Vein or Hidden Nursery. Let's just grab another Nursery for some more discovering later in the game. Pathfinding Axe Draw from our opponent. 4-3, explores when it hits the board for great value, it does draw them their land. If I trade into the guide, they do get a treasure off the Scallywag. I guess I could trade into the Scallywag too. I would like to trade into the guide because of that Vigilance. Probably better to trade into it on blocks than on attacks. I guess these don't really attack into the axe draw like the surveyor does, though, which is awkward. Mm. And maybe I just throw a torch at it. Take six here if I let it in. This is a little rough. Poison dart frogs. So we don't find a land, so if I want to torch the guide, I have to torch the guide, play a frog and a dreadmaw's ire. No Altasaur. I do hit pretty hard if I do that. It's probably fine. And then I've got good mana from Poison Dart Frog next turn. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. And this way we're killing all their stuff during our turns. They don't get any... Descend treasures off of the Scallywag. Plus, we get to kill the one treasure they do have, which is cute. But we are definitely behind on cards at this point. We've got two hidden nurseries to make up for that. Once we run out of stuff to do, we can just discover two turns in a row. So it's kind of like we have three cards in hand, sort of, kind of. Which makes the uh, the card advantage disparity look a little less bad. But the life totals are looking good for us. They're at 8 life and we can start shooting them for 2 a turn no matter what with the Altasaur. Once we get that on the board. The Ceratops is terrifying. Can't we block this up by 3 or more creatures? Played this thing a couple times. Always love it. Oh, they shuffled it away though. With the Promising Vein. Well, now we don't have to worry about the Ceratops. So that's cute. That is nice. Find a Goblin Tomb Raider. That does have haste here, and thanks to Dart Frog, we've got perfect mana. We are cool with all the trades, and we're definitely cool with getting damage in. Alright, so they go down to six. And here's the Altasaur. If we can tap this thing three times, they're dead.
Bristleback's a big one. We're definitely not getting any more attacks in. But we can certainly do some taps and some pings. Probably a little better to get a guaranteed 6-5 on the board than to just spin the wheel for a random card. So let's get a 6-5 on blocks. And just get pinging with the Altasaur. Again, if it sticks around three turns, we can get there off of it. Trumpeting Carnosaur. Incredible bomb rare. Love that card. 7-6 Trample that discovers 5. Hits in a braid. Really solid discover here. And it, this has the extra flexibility in the early game when you have it in hand of just spending 3 mana, discarding it, shooting something for 3. They are going to cast the Abrade, kill the Tomb Raider or the Dart Frog here. Dart Frog probably the better pick because of the uh, the Death Touch. Yeah, and the Mana Ramp. So they do kill the Dart Frog. So, I mean, at least the Altasaur is still around, which is the important part. Send in the Bristle back. We trade the Monster Saur for that. Yep. Here it is. Maybe. We'll see. If they send it and I'm trading the Monster Saur in it. Yeah, I know I can trade it up into the Carnosaur later. Um... But I can't just take five, and I also don't really want to trump with the Tomb Raider. Yeah, I think we're just trying to hit more creatures to throw some chumps under the Trampler in the end. Digging off the nursery if we hit a land, and if we don't hit a land, that means we hit a spell to cast instead. Staggering Size is a spell to cast, I guess. If I attack and they block with the 3-3, three, three, they die. If I attack and they block with the 7-6, we have an 8 toughness Altasar that kills it, and they go to 3. If I attack and they block with both, that's horrific. So the only way it goes wrong is if they block with both, in which case I still kill Carnosaur. I think we're still just on tap Altasar twice, right? Because just... If they just don't hit removal for literally one more turn, they lose. I just tap it now, and then I tap it after I untap. And that's it, game's over. This is their last draw step to kill the Altasaur. Uh, I can make it 8 toughness and it lives here. Unless they have double removal. Let's see the double removal. One card in their hand and one turn to kill us, or our Altasaur. If they kill the Altasaur, then they kill us. Send in the team, I can't afford to block with the Altasaur anywhere, so we chump block the 3-3 three, three with the Tomb Raider. That is the maximum damage I can stop this turn. If I block the Carnosaur with the Tomb Raider, I'm stopping 2 damage instead of 3. Okay, down to seven. Tap the Altasaur. During their end step, draw for turn. Tap the Altasaur. And that is game. We are two and one off the mirror match, heading into round number four. Here we are on the play for round four with a pretty excellent hand. That Kin Collar into Raptor put in some work last time. We'll see what it can do again this game. Don't hit a two drop, so we'll get the torch down. Uh, yeah, I'm going to get the torch down. I mean, I can forest cycle the Bristleback to guarantee a turn four Raptor, but Bristleback is such a good card to cast off of the Raptor mana that uh, it would be a little awkward here, so I'd rather just hope for the land, I think. Playing against a blue-red deck. My favorite archetype in the format. I think the blue-red artifact aggro decks are really strong. 
There's the Waterwind Scout to be able to attack with the Shipwreck Sentry, and we are not going to block. Because we can crack back with the Kin Caller here, and that's pretty great. And then drop our Hulking Raptor. That life gain from the Kin Caller coming in hot. We're still at 20 here, even though they've domed us for three. And I'll have seven mana next turn if they can't kill the Raptor, and because it has Ward 2, it should be pretty hard for them to. If they have a fourth mana, they can play in a Braid and spend the extra two and kill it. But if they can't do that, we just play a Forest and a Bristleback bristle next turn. Uh, and that should be pretty crushing. There's a Brackish Blunder on top for our opponents that can bounce one of our cards. So they can use that to kill the token that Bristleback makes if we do play it, but they are going to mill the blunder, so we don't have to worry about that. And here's a Waterwind Scout map token, which just lets them draw land. So they've got one blue mana up. Play a Cogwork Wrestler, just main phase, so that they can attack with the sentry. Send in for five. So they can double block the raptor to kill it. Really depends what I draw into, if I would want... To let that happen. I guess I can, instead of Bristleback, I can Dreadmaw draw two and then Torch shoot the Wrestler to be able to attack in with both of these. I feel like that's a pretty solid line. And then I can still Bristleback next turn, maybe even Bristleback plus Staggering Size. It is less card draw in the grand scheme of things than if I waited till after Bristleback, but this game is looking like a tempo game where we're trying to outrace our opponent. Where clearing the path for attacks here is pretty awesome. Putting them down to nine. And I've got a six six on blocks if they don't deal with this Dreadmaw. And Gold Fury Strider does not deal with this Dreadmaw, but they still get the scout in in the sky, obviously. So we're down to 13 now. They're at 9 life. Staggering size could absolutely kill our opponent out of nowhere, potentially. I can't play the Bristleback and the Staggering Size awkwardly. I could discover and play Staggering Size. How important is it to hold that up? Feels pretty important. It could randomly kill our opponent here. It can save our Hulking Raptor. It's a lot of things it can do, so let's discover plus Staggering Size instead. rather than Bristleback. Get a Burning Sun Cavalry. Send in the squad. All right, hit for nine and we're good. Literally anywhere I cast the Staggering Size kills them, so we might as well save the Raptor and kill them. And there you go. That is gonna be three and one now. At least another 50-50 or better run. Really solid stuff out of a somewhat risky, uh, somewhat mediocre deck here that's definitely got some flaws, but we've just been drawing our incredible Mana Ramp Dino for a few of these games. And the staggering size combat trick been putting in a lot of work. Three and one it is. At least an even run as we head into round five. Here we are now for game number five on the play. Tomb Raider to attack as a one power creature turn two, but once we get the stone tree out, it'll be buffed. We've got the stone tree to ramp it to the Altasaur. We have two different caves to craft for the stone tree. Hand looks very reasonable. Definitely a keep. I'd be awkwardly playing the nursery turn two here. I guess I could just get the nursery out of the way. Just in case we top deck something. Like a solid two mana green spell, like our card that searches for a forest puts it into play tapped or something. Because we only really miss out on like one point of damage by not playing the Tomb Raider turn one. I think I still just play this thing out. I guess the other argument is that the Stone Tree really wants us to exile a cave from our grave for the crafting, ideally. So we could also go... Um... Mountain Tomb Raider, and then like Promising Vein turn two to get a cave into the grave immediately. So that's another path to take. 
and then the promising vein finds just a forest here. Probably do that. I guess. Uh oh, another tap land. We are gonna get uh, get crushed by some tap lands this game. All right, let's go promising vein into forest to get a cave in the grave for the future. I think. There's a current conductor for our opponent. If they do a lot of exploring, they are going to go to absolute value town, immediately putting the lands they explore into onto the battlefield, and getting extra plus one plus one counters off the explorer onto the current conductor themselves. I do find a poison dart frog to play instead of a stone tree, which still ramps us up a mana here. Doesn't buff the Tomb Raider anymore, but even a 2-2 Tomb Raider can't attack into this 2-3 body because this thing is just under-costed. So yeah, let's just play the Dart Frog here. Go from there. Into the Altasar this turn off of an untapped land. And there's the Explore value off the Nikon Zeal. Immediately put that land into play. Can send in the Tomb Raider and then drop the Altasaur. No trade. Here's the Altasaur. It's looking like a spooky matchup. I mean, they got a really, really powerful build around Signpost Uncommon. And the weakest aspect of our deck is a lack of removal. So this is just going to keep popping off with all their Explore cards for extra value and there's just nothing we can do about it. So I am already very sketched out by our chances this game. Probably the worst matchup I could imagine is if our opponent plays Captain Storm turn two. I think we lose that matchup every time. The captain that puts plus one plus one counters onto their stuff every time they play an artifact. Because we just can't clear out premium little cards like that without removal spells. We only have two, and they're both narrow. So, could Stone Tree and play the Gnome here, I guess? Sure. I guess if I played the Gnome first, I would guarantee that I hit whatever land I want. So I probably should have played Gnome for a Hidden Nursery and then played Stone Tree, and then just pick up the Hidden Nursery that I just put on top of my deck. Yeah, that was not correct. Pathfinding Axe Draw for the Double Explorer. Yeah, their deck is really good. I just love explore value plays in general. Like, even without a current conductor, this deck would just be great already, just playing a bunch of explorer creatures like River Herald Scouts and Axe Draws. Another land for us. How does this one work? When it attacks, another creature gets plus 2, plus 0, and you untap that creature. Yeah, it's only a 3-4 body, though, so it's just not going to be good here against a 4-5, a 5-4, all that kind of stuff. So we simply flip a 5-5 five, five onto the board on blocks. So I have a 5-5 five, five and a 1-1 one, one Death Toucher ready to block anything that attacks, and we just keep pinging with the Altasaur. Maybe our opponent will have the same problem, and we can just keep this Altasaur on board for 8 more turns. It's a possibility. They will get to start making 7-7s seven soon-ish with the Tendril. But Altasaur might be able to race that, weirdly enough. Since they don't get to make 7-7s seven till at least next turn, and every time they make a 7-7, seven seven, um, that's one less land that they have on board to tap towards making other 7-7s. Seven I mean, we'll see. I mean, it's going to be a big problem, this Tendril. But there's a chance. 
Altasaur outpaces it. It's a very small chance, but a chance nonetheless. I can survey her or I can discover a random card. Let's just survey her here and then I'll have two caves to crack later. So we still find our last cave regardless, even if I didn't do the right compass gnome play with the uh, stone tree earlier. Self-reflection, get a copy of an axe draw. Explore again. Draw land, put it into play. They are really popping off here. Play it untapped since they don't have another land in hand to play. Send in an axe draw. We activate a ridge line, trade a ridge line into the axe draw here. Yeah, we want six toughness blocking that. They're down to 12. Six more turns for Altasaur to kill them. Kin Color's not a bad draw. My Dart Frog's gonna be tapped this turn if I play it, but. I think that's fine. Hit a Burning Sun Cavalry. Reasonable. There's some more blockers. That one's going to be a 3 3. Another River Herald Scout. More explore value all day long. Another self reflection. They can mill that one and flash it back. Cool. Self-reflection, the axe jaw again. Explore again. Hit a water wind scout on top. Go to combat, send in the 5-4. And the 6-7, that's interesting. Maybe they have a trick here, but I mean... That's pretty great on board. And then this is six toughness. They only kill one of these. They only kill one of these. Let's see the trick. They draw into the plus three, plus three trample here. Be pretty good. But they can only use it on one of these combats. Oh, it's the Cogwork Wrestler. Still one, two, three, four, five. I guess not quite enough. Maybe I should have went for like uh, triple blocks here. And this is still not the worst combat for me. They're down to 10. We're still at 21. Do I have a bunch of dinos in grave? I've got a 3-3 dino in grave. And put this on board and make a fourth, or sorry, a 3-4 off of it next turn. Or I can wait till I draw a card so I can discard draw two, then flip this thing. I think I would rather draw into anything and then discard that draw two and flip this next turn in the same turn. Wish I didn't play a land here. Would have been better off the explore for sure. Another axe draw on top. <laughs> Still popping off over there. 
self-reflection in Axtraw. This is wild stuff. Wild that this game's gonna be really close to whoever wins. It's looking like they're favored at this point, which is how wide things have gotten, but they're still gonna be down to eight. And we've got a lot of attackers that could potentially crack back if they're not careful. They're tapped out. So whatever blocks are favorable, we can just slam dunk right here. So I can slam dunk a 3-3 onto a 2-3. Slam dunk a 4-5 onto a 3-1. Slam dunk the death toucher onto the 8-9. Then unfortunately, yeah, their board is too big. We have to let some of it through or run out of uh, creatures for the rest of their stuff pretty soon. Which is scary. Yeah, I mean, let's trade. Trade all over here. Three, four toughness. I can't stack up. Six toughness on this axe draw. Do like this, I guess. Take five. Keep multiple of these. Not horrible, but they do get the wider board state here, but they had the wider board state before the attack, too. Land for us. That is the card to ditch on the lattice. Still actually only have the one dino in grave right now for the lattice, which is super sad. And we're gonna have to just flip it as a 3-4. We don't find anything else to play. We find a Sunfire Torch. An extra two damage out of nowhere could change things. Play a Burning Sun Cavalry for a 3-3, three, three, or flip a Lattice as a 3-4. I guess I flipped a 3-4, because it's not going to matter if it's any bigger. So we should get the biggest man investment out of the way. And it's not going to be any bigger unless the Altasaur dies, in which case we no longer have a game plan anyway. Another current conductor that definitely explains the attack with the last one. Drop an axe draw. No fight spell removal spell on top of their deck. Aw, oh, shoot. So I only get to ping them for two more damage with Altasaur? That's literally one turn off. I need to ping them down to two life to win. And I can ping them down to four instead of two. That is a single ping off from winning this game. Dang. Well. Shoot. Maybe I can get them to, like, let two damage in? I guess I'm also probably just gonna die on their next attack regardless. So yeah, we are just trying to crack in somehow. For lethal. But the Sunfire Torch, I have to sack it when I attack, so it's not like they can... They'll know that the damage is coming. We can't surprise kill them with it. Could just take 15 here, but then... They can block everything on board. Can't win that way. Ah, oh, it's so, so close. We can put them to two, but that's it. I guess since we're all in on killing them next turn, we might as well take 15. Because otherwise Battle Glyph just wins the game. We'll see what we draw, but I don't think anything kills them. If we draw a trample trick, actually, Yearling is not a trample trick. 
Neither of these have haste. Oh, astronomically close. Maybe there's somewhere we could have found two damage earlier. Bummer. Absolute bummered way to end it. Put them to two, but two is not zero. And that's game. Three and two. Heading into round number six. Here we are now for round six. Definitely need to draw another forest specifically, but if we do, that hulking raptor is going to lead to some incredible stuff. There's a ruin lurker bat to start things off for our opponent. I think I need to just curve out with the firstborn here, sadly. Rather than sitting here doing nothing till turn four. We don't hit the forest, we're going to have a very bad time. Deadweight, the firstborn? That's going to play really bad for our opponent. Oh no, this only blows up artifacts. It's not an artifact or enchantment blow up card. Sad. So it plays fine for our opponent in that case. Let's discard the monster sword, draw two, looking for the forest. We find the promising vein, which is quite awkward, because it will not be the green source for raptor the moment that I need the green source. So we just play mountain anyway, because I need to spend an extra mana to sack this. I can't sack it if I just play it right now. So we just play a torch and pass then to be mana efficient. And raptor is not going to come out till turn five, most likely. A screaming phantom over there. There's stone tree. Stone tree can find the green source, and then we just put the torch on our firstborn to kill their phantom. I think that's fine. And there's the green source. I think we take the ridge line over the nursery. Yeah, zero one firstborn. Putting in work, throwing a torch at the phantom. There's a careening minecart. Oh my god, our zero one firstborn is about to put in some more work. <laughs> it's gonna Dreadmaw's ire it up here. Yeah, sure is. We're gonna blow up a minecart with our zero one. I scoff at your dead weight. I will still find usage of my firstborn. There's a deep cavern. Oh, that's really, really sad. I was about to draw some cards off that thing. Oh, hey, staggering size. Good lord. Got any dinos in grave? Oh, I do have the 6-5 dino. I can flip a lattice here instead of using ridgeline. It's probably better. Get a 6-4 here. Boom. The bigness. Oh no, don't do it. Don't do that, opponent. I will not trump attack with the firstborn. I will get my Dreadmaw back. I've done so much with my Zero One Firstborn. It's actually kind of awesome. Let's just draw a ton of cards. Go to Value Town. Woo! Oh my god. Probably trade into the 5-3 to stop the mana, but we still send in and get 6 damage in. Alright, trading with the raptors on too. This game's been incredible. We've just been drawing into straight action here. And a lot of our little trick plays with Firstborn have gone really well.
Okay, still hitting for 5 here. Can hit for 10, but 10 is not 11, which is not lethal. I still think it's probably worth it to do that. Because I can do that and still play the Altasaur. I've got exactly enough mana. Send it with the Firstborn just because it's been the absolute mascot of this game. It's been actually perfect. And there is the concession from our opponent. So we are now 4 and 2. We have saved ourselves from losing any value here. And now we are guaranteed to be at least breaking even out of this draft. Really solid stuff for a somewhat mediocre deck here for sure. This draft pod did not work out super well for us. We bounced out, uh, bounced around a lot early in the draft. Didn't really find a solid home till later. And even then, the home that we found, the two-color pair, not the most open color pair at the table. So pretty happy to be at least at a positive win rate run here and definitely happy to be leaving the event with at least as many gems as it cost to play. All right, here we are on the play for game seven. We've got a compass gnome turn two to guarantee an untapped red source on turn three, and I think that just solves any mana issues the hand has. I mean, obviously we stop at three mana potentially, but uh, then it's basically a three lander, which is a very reasonable keep. Playing against a red-white deck. They're going to kill our 2-1 gnome? Nope, they're going to drop a volatile wanderglyph. I am not going to combat trick or sunfire torch that thing. But I will take a trade if they want it. Cool. Now if they don't removal spell our kin collar or buff their wanderglyph, they can't get an attack in here. I think it's worth it to show them the dread maw. Because I feel like they were already going to use cards like a braid on the kin collar anyway, so it's not like showing them the Dread Maw makes them any more likely to kill our dinosaurs. They're already going to spend removal on our dinosaurs if they can. All right. Unless our opponent is a bluff master, I don't think we should go anywhere near this Wanderglyph here. So I'm not going to block. Especially when we have a combat trick in hand to really win the fight. Oh wow, Dreadmaw's ire is incredible here. Make this a 5-5 to beat the Raptor and kill the Wanderglyph at the same time. Good lord almighty. Dang, I wish I had a second red source here so I could put a torch onto the gnome and attack with both. Yeah, I don't feel like they're likely to block Kin Collar with the Raptor if I don't do something like that. I guess I can just double combat trick this turn. If they do block the Gnome instead of the Kin Collar. Four, five, six toughness? Yeah, we can do that. Triumphant Chomp on the Gnome, they get revenge. And there's a Plundering Pirate, I can torch that to keep the Ken Collar coming in. Ooh, and I can cast a Frog in the same turn, which is a beautiful draw. Giving us one more mana towards the Dreadmaw, we're one land away. Poke them down to eight now. And they have theoretically just one turn to kill the Kin Collar to stop my Dread Maw from drawing cards. But hey, Colossal Dread Maw is a good magic card. Six mana, six, six trample. Does some reasonable stuff. All right, no removal. Come on, top deck, basic land. Ah, no Dread Maw. But if I had to pick a non-land card to draw, it would be a dinosaur here. So that by the time I play the Dread Maw, 
I get to draw even more cards. So let's just drop the yearling and pass, and we'll crack the promising vein and hope to draw another land. Technically, I am thinning out the lands a tiny, tiny percentage by pulling a basic out with this vein, but it's good to get that, uh, that out of the way, so we have just colored mana from then on. And they do send in the Dynatomaton, so we are going to take four, go to 17. Boom. One card left in their hand, and they're not going to play it yet. So who knows what that'll be. Give the deck a nice shuffle. Make sure to put a land right on top with our sleight of hand skills, and there you go. See what their last card is. It's probably not something that can kill both of our dinosaurs, but it might be a removal spell for one of them, so that I just draw one card here instead of two. But even then, a 6-6 trample that draws one card is a big deal on this board state. Oh my god, it's going to draw two cards. And the yearling's going to stick around as a 6-2? Boom! Oh, it might be a sawblade, something that shoots a tapped creature. So currently we're dealing seven to our opponent if they block like this, but they are killing the yearling. And it happens, they're down to one. It's a quicksand whirlpool to exile our 6-6 six, six trampler, but they're at one life and they top deck a land and that is game. We are now five and two in the money out of this draft. Really great spot to be with the more mediocre deck as i've been saying maybe the deck's a little better than i'm giving it credit for but don't think it is uh incredible i don't think i drafted super super hot today but we're still up in gems just continuing to go infinite here as we head into round eight here we are on the play for game a lot game number eight now five and two yep got that turn one tomb raider no artifacts to go with it but then we've got a turn three kin color which is nice we just play a tapped nursery turn two Get the tap line out of the way. I think that's pretty reasonable. Alright, opponent plays a tap line turn one. Aw, oh, we hit a great two drop since I chose to not play the uh, tapped green card turn one. I guess this is pretty solid late in the game too. I have nothing to ramp into right now, so we might just use this to pick up a cave later in the game. Because for now, we're just curving out. Play a 3-3. Three, three. Don't gain any life on it or anything, but still a 3-3 three, three, turn 3. And yeah, maybe we sack a Promising Vein and pick up a Promising Vein, or sack a Nursery and pick up a Nursery later. Okay. Uh, they can't kill... They can't do anything good against Kin Color if I Staggering Size it here, so we can send that in really freely. Okay, single block. Double block would have been even grosser for us. That would have been really good, but single block is still fine. Give them some cards that can't block here and drop a nursery. Pit of Offerings. Exile my staggering size and their black cards. They have black and green mana off this land. Pretty cute. Get a combat trick, a fungus up into killing a Tomb Raider? I mean, I have no artifacts in hand, so I'll take that risk. If Tomb Raider dies to a combat trick, then good, honestly. We get the combat trick from killing something that's a lot more uh, impactful than a 1-2. But it's just a fanatical offering, they're just going to sack the fungus to draw some cards. Now they will explore with the map token. Have a terror tide on top of their deck which they're going to keep to draw later. Currently, it gives everything minus zero, minus zero, but it might matter if the game goes really long here, so... Interesting. They'll definitely need to play a lot of self-mill to get it to matter. Alright, I think... Just holding on to this, and I'm just going to use Hidden Nursery like two turns in a row after this turn, and then we'll pick up one of our Hidden Nurseries with this Glimpse the Core. 
because we're just hitting a bunch of lands here, and that is all we got. There's a panicked Altasar from our opponent. It can ping and shoot us for a couple damage. And more importantly, it stops all our attacks while our opponent's down to 10 here. Let's filter out a land, see if we can draw a non-land here. We find our own Altasaur. Okay. I mean, perfectly balanced. All things should be, I suppose. There's the mirror match for you. Now we just keep pinging each other with Altasaurs. They're in a black deck, though, and there's so many good black removal spells. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't think our Altasaur sticks around, so they're just going to kill us with theirs. Might all be over here, but I'm very happy to have made it this far regardless. We'll see. Let's crack the nursery and see what we hit, because that is another land for us. Luckily, it's probably the best land we could draw at this point, since it can actually block as a creature. Oof. But our Discover is probably the worst spell to hit. Just a dirtily little equipment. Does not impact things much. Yep. Start chipping away with the Altasar. We're down to 11 now. There's a Skullcap Snail. There goes our bonus land. What is this land number 10 or something? 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Land number 9. We'll get exiled. Pass the turn. Here is land number 10 for us. Spin that nursery wheel again. Oh. have to draw that instead of casting it so I can actually shoot something with it later. But it's not even going to be enough damage to kill the Altasaur, so we're still in a really bad predicament here. Hold up, does the dinosaur deal the damage? Ooh, it does. If I give one of my... If I give my kin caller the blowgun so it has death touch, then I can kill the Altasaur. Slow this game down, potentially. Unless our opponent has removal for the kin caller. Ooh, just shut off blocks and find lethal. Fair enough. Okay, G <laughs> daring discovery of the geological appraiser is not fair at all. Never mind about the fair enough. Discovering to discover is always gross. Um... But yeah, I mean, that's a fair way to die here. Just shut off the blocks and get in. The discovering into appraiser didn't change anything. We were already dead on board, but that is still nasty when something like that happens. Discover into discover. Just keep rolling the wheel. All right, we'll certainly take that. Five and three here. Very, very respectable record for this deck. I'm pretty happy with that. Don't think this draft went incredibly well. Um, I would definitely have to look back on it, see stuff we could have committed to here. Uh, but it's been long enough since I did the draft portion here that I don't remember exactly what was open where. Did a lot of just dancing around pack one, trying to stick to just taking the strongest cards in each pack, and that ended up with us dancing around with a ton of different colors, none of which seemed particularly more open than the rest. I mean, there was a little while blue was looking decently open because we got a relatively late scout and... Uh, well, they're both scouts. Relatively late Water Wind and River Herald Scout. Um, we got some Cloud Guards late there, but we just didn't see too many other premium white commons. Um, black, we opened up a pretty sweet rare with the Corpses of the Lost, but not until later in the draft did we see a bunch of Join the Deads and Dead Weights. We saw those mid-pack too. So maybe a pivot onto the black here would have worked well for us. Saw some good blue near the end of pack one, so if we latched onto that good blue, maybe headed into a blue-black direction like we did in our previous draft, that might have been the best place, most winning place to be. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Not a great draft in terms of how well we drafted I would say, but it all panned out perfectly fine for us in the end. A 5-3 record is something we'll take all day long. We're just up in gyms out of the event, so not the end of the world at all. Just uh, 
interesting to look back on the draft in itself and see where things might have went better. And I think that might have been the best route we could have possibly taken here, maybe heading to blue-black. But green-red dinos did work out okay in the end, so maybe if we stuck really hard to green-red and just took mediocre green and red spells over really nice blue and white spells early, like instead of taking the Cloud Guard, instead of taking the Waterwind Scout or River Herald Scout, just take whatever mediocre green card was in the pack, maybe the deck would end up better. But as far as I remember, it was stuff like a Mineshaft Spider or uh, the 5-4 Trampling Cat Warrior. Like, we were taking them over those kind of spells that I genuinely don't think would make this deck any better anyway. So, I don't know. I don't know. Interesting draft for sure. And still... Despite the draft process not panning out super well, the end result is still pretty great here. 1,600 gems and four packs out of the prizes for our 1,500 gem event. Really, really nice way to end it. But that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.